hands together. Communications team. Great job. Uh, so if you'd like to be on one of those videos, you should totally head out in the gathering area after worship. We'd love to, to video you. Um, we are kicking off uh, a new series called Mixtape. And what we decided, uh, you know, the second half of summer, one of the things that I do, uh, I love to put like a little playlist together of songs that, are, uh, that move me, songs I love to listen to. And so what we did as a, kind of as a staff and as a teaching team is pull together some scripture verses that really move us, things that we feel like are important. And things that, uh, as opposed to scriptures that have gotten twisted, these are scriptures that like speak to us, and we think not only do they have something to say to us, but we're hoping to talk about them in a way that ha- says something to you also. Um, okay, I just want you to take a minute, and I want you to think about this question for like five seconds, uh, and then I'm actually going to ask you to share your answer to this question with a neighbor. So if your neighbor is too far away to share it, you might want to scoot closer, Okay. I'll let you scoot while you're thinking, all right? What's the worst way to die? The way that you hope that you never die. Think about that for a second. Got it? Now share that one with your neighbor. What's the worst way to die the way that you definitely don't want to go? Okay. So, is that not enough time? This is the most excited I've ever heard this room. So dark you guys all are, right? Okay, now I want you to think about this. Think about this one. What's, what's the best way to die? The way that you definitely hope that you go? No one has to even think about that, right? What's the best way to go? In your sleep, of course it is. Um, You know, you can't talk about Christianity without talking about death. You know why you can't? Um, it's, it's the, it's one of the main symbols of our faith. You know, the thing that, that uh, we wear around our, uh, around our neck in gold, or we embroider them on our Bible covers. We put them in wood on our church buildings, uh, is the symbol of Christianity is a, is an instrument of death. And so you can't talk about something meaningful within Christianity without talking about it. Paul writes a letter um, to a group of churches in an area of his world. Uh, This book is called Colossians. And um, I'm actually going to read the section that we're going to talk about today. And I kind of don't want you to turn to it in your Bibles if you brought it. We're not going to put it on the screen. And the reason why is because if, if you were part of this early church, uh, did you know that through most of the history of the people of faith, both Hebrews and Christians, um, people didn't have their own copies of the Bible that they read? I'm not saying that's a bad development. I think it's a great one. I just think that it's good for us to remember that the earliest people who heard scriptures listened to it first. They, they heard it told to them. And I thought it might be refreshing for us instead of putting it up on the screens. I'm going to read the section that we're going to talk about, and I want you just to listen to it. I want you to listen to it with not only your human ears so that you hear it, but also your heart. What parts of this scripture verse is God stirring in you? And then I promise we're going to go through chunk by chunk and we'll put it up on the screen, okay? Here's what Paul writes to some of the earliest Christians in a letter where he's trying to communicate some things that he really cares about. Here's what he says in chapter 3. If you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, then you should act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along with your eyes to the ground, absorbed with things that are right in front of you. Look up. and Be alert to what's going on around Christ. Because that's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life, it's dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though it's invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. Christ is your life. And when Christ, your real life, shows up again on this earth, you will show up too. The real you. The glorious you. Did you know that there's a glorious you? (laughs) Meanwhile, be content with obscurity, just like Jesus. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, 
impurity, lust. Paul lived in a real different world than we do, right? None of that stuff is here anymore. Put to death doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it. Grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. And it's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. Wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better, but now you know better. So make sure it's all gone for good. All the bad temper, all the irritability, no elbowing your neighbors, okay? Get rid of all the meanness, all the profanity. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's actually like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes that you've stripped off and put in the fire. And now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, slave and free, these things don't mean anything. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, you should dress in the wardrobe that God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. You should be even-tempered. You should be able to be content with second place. Ouch. Quick to forgive an offense. You should forgive as quickly and as completely as the master has forgiven you. And regardless of what else you put on, you should wear love. It is your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Never be without love. Now, um, in this book of Colossians, Paul is talking about some things that are real, real important. Things that I wanted to pass along. Things about life and death. Things about beginning a life. Things about what advanced Christianity looks like. But the first thing that Paul says, and one of the things I love about Paul, is he gets right to the point. Here's what he says, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 2. We're going to put this up on the screen, and you can turn to it now uh, in your scriptures if you'd like to. Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Like Paul jumps right into it, and he addresses us as human beings, and he says, you have to take responsibility for yourself. No one else can set your mind on something, and no one else can set your heart on something. This is part of what we as human beings have. We have the ability to choose. And the thing is, only we can choose for ourselves where our hearts and our minds are set. Our minds and our hearts are the parts of us that drive us. They're like the command centers for us. We make decisions based on this. You know that you as a human being, one of the things that you're actually built for is to make decisions? I didn't say make good ones. I just said make decisions. Ever since the very first story in the garden where Adam Adam is in the garden and God brings the animals to Adam, and what does he have Adam do to the animals? Do you remember? He has them name them. He chooses and assigns names for the animals. Adam is a decider. He's a decision maker. And do you know why? Because he's made in the image of the one who is the decision maker. Each one of us human beings, every one of you in the room and this person right here, we make decisions. We decide where we set our minds and we decide where we set our hearts. I hear some people talk and the way that they communicate it, it's as if life is happening to them. And Paul gets right to the matter and says, although there are situations in your life that can feel out of control, no one else can control your mind but you. No one else can choose where you put your heart but you. It's really important, and you should choose really wisely. Uh, My wife uh, and kids just came back. They were out of town for two long weeks, 14 long, lonely days around my house. And while they were gone, I got a couple text messages. Now, I have have a daughter who's 15 and a half, a son who's 13. And the inevitable thing that's happening right now is first she and then he, 
They're going to learn to do something that I'm terrified of. They're going to learn to drive. You should be terrified too. Um, now, this is hard for my family, so I got a, I got a text message from them. Uh, my wife learned to drive at the, at the little fairground uh, in Adrian, Michigan, the town where she grew up, because it's kind of a safe spot for streets. So I got a text message, and it was a picture of my daughter behind the wheel of a car. And I was like as nervous about that as I was when we like put her in a car seat. The very first time she rode in a car, I had the same kind of feeling. Um, And just when I was trying to get over the terror of that, then I got the next one, which is my 13-year-old son behind the wheel of a car at the fairground. Now I was almost in cardiac arrest. Now, the thing about driving in my family is, uh, the the thing about driving in my family that's hard and probably different from your family is that my family, almost all of us struggle with the root sin of bossiness. Um, And I don't know where it comes from. Really, every person in my family besides my oldest son totally thinks that they're the boss and in charge. Can you imagine driving anywhere in a car with us? Now, I used to only have to deal with like shame, ridicule, and taking commands from the right side of the car, from the passenger seat. But now the older my kids get, the the direction and shame comes from all directions. It's like Dolby surround sound judgment in my car. Wherever I'm going, even if it's three blocks away, whatever route I take, someone in my family will critique it. They'll say, why are we going this way? This is the long way. You should have gone the other way. And I tell them, this is my car. These keys are my keys, and this way is my way. I live in a family where everyone wants to be in charge. You know, many people find Jesus pretty handy in the passenger seat of their life, especially when they require his services. I think this is something that would have irritated Paul. Think about this. Think about when folks have a health problem and they call to Jesus from the passenger seat. I need your help. Something hard's going on at work and I'd like it to be different. I feel anxious. I want some peace of mind. I'm feeling sad and I need a little bit of hope. I'm facing death. I'm facing death and I want to make sure that I'm secure on the other side. Lots of people call out to Christ from the passenger seat when they need help. But not all these people are certain that they want Jesus driving. Because if Jesus is behind the wheel, then you're not. And I'm not. Here's a couple examples. For instance, if Jesus is in control and in charge, if you're going to set your minds and hearts on the things that Jesus cares about, if your life is going to be in Christ, that means that your wallet isn't your wallet. Whose wallet is it? Jesus's. You don't get to choose when you want to be generous or when you don't want to be generous. Because now it's Jesus' money, and your job is to be faithful. If I let Jesus drive, I'm not in charge of my ego. I no longer have the right to satisfy every self-centered ambition that I have, and I have a lot. Now it's his life. I'm not in charge of my mouth anymore. (laughs) I don't get to gossip. I don't get to flatter. I don't get to condemn people. I don't get to be dishonest. I don't get to curse or rage. I don't get to intimidate or manipulate. I don't even get to exaggerate because it's not my mouth anymore. It's his mouth. If I get out of the driver's seat and I hand over the keys to Jesus, I need to be fully engaged. In fact, when this happens, I believe, and I think Paul believed, and he wrote to the Colossians and said, if you get out of the way and let Jesus lead, you will be more alive than you ever have been before. I think he deeply believed it. Early on in the sermon, I'm going to get right to it and ask you a question. Have you invited Jesus along for a ride with you, or have you put him behind the wheel? Who's deciding? Jesus is real clear on this point. He says there is no way for a human being to come back to the Father that does not involve surrender, that does not involve death. There is no pathway like that. You see, the thing is for Paul, what he starts off this letter saying uh, in in chapter 3, he starts talking about this idea of resurrection. He's talking to a group of people that have chosen to follow Jesus, and he talks sort of funny about that because what he says is he, he talks to them as if they've already been resurrected. He said, your new life has already started. It's past tense. You started this new life already. Then I just have a question for you. For those of you that are in the room who've chosen the same thing, you've chosen to receive the new life that Jesus Christ offered, how long is that life going to last? 
How long are you going to be living this new life? The answer is a long, long, long time. And so what does that make all of us? If you just started doing something that you're going to be doing for a long, long time, what that makes you and what that makes me, we're rookies. We're new ones at this. And I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you've been following Jesus for 70 years or six of them. We are all learning. We are all learning. And I think Paul deeply believed that. You see, Paul starts talking about building a life. And one of the reasons why he talks about building a life is because in Colossians chapter 3, when we get back to it, he has something very specific to say. And that is you have to start building a life if you're a Christian because your old life is dead. It's over. Now, um, I don't do many weddings. I'm not really sure why. I think part of the reason is that I have a more casual style, uh, and lots of folks don't want the minister marrying them from a table and a stool. I don't think that goes over well. But the last wedding I did was for a really close friend of mine. In fact, it was for a friend of mine who's like a sister to me. Uh, in fact, she is a sister to me in the body of Christ. She spent most of the last 10 years of our friendship um, deeply wanting to be married. And a few years ago, in a really surprising place, she found love. She fell in love with one of her closer friends. And this summer, they got married. It was a beautiful ceremony. The minister was really incredible. He did a great job. (laughs) He was on the verge of tears the whole time. You know, it really is something to see people find each other and fall in love. It touches us deeply. It's stirring, I think. They said, I do, and they promised to turn away from an old way of life of singleness and selfishness and turn towards each other. And they started a new life together. They both have a good bit of life experience, and yet they were starting over. They're rookies. And all of us that have been married for more than 10 years know there's a lot that they're going to have to learn. So yesterday, uh, on one of the hottest days of the year, they decided it was time to move. And since I'm a friend, I had to help. Right? They say, you know who your real friends are on moving day, right? So I had to be there. So we had lots of sweat and some pizza and some fun, and we helped them move in. Earlier that morning, I sent her a text message. I told her that it was a big day for her, that today she was going to start building a home. If you're married here, do you remember the first home that you lived in with your spouse? Do you remember when you first started building that home? You have to sort things out. You have to decide, like, who's going to get to arrange the living room and against which wall should the couch go? You know, do towels get folded in half or threefold? That was a big fight for us. I don't know how you dealt with that. That was a big fight for us. One of the things I wanted her to know that morning is that a marriage, just like a life, is something that you build. It doesn't get gifted to you. In fact, the language that the Bible uses about our relationship with Christ, the kind of picture most often used is that of a marriage. When you choose to bind yourself to Jesus Christ, you choose to start building a life. And let me tell you, there's no one better to build a life with than Jesus. I think the core of the message that Paul has in Colossians is he's trying to encourage these believers and and even us today that we should be excited to build a new life with the master of life. In Colossians chapter 3, let's turn there again. Let's pick it up, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he says. He says it real frank, for you died. And this isn't metaphorical talk for Paul. In fact, Paul uses a Greek tense, which has a sense of finality and past to it. Like, it is absolutely completely done. It's past history. He's saying it as if it's thoroughly happened. For you have died. If you've chosen to follow Christ, that old life that you had is dead. Let me encourage you, today, out at Lake Phelan, A whole group of people have made a commitment to say that their old life is dead and they're going to inaugurate the building of a new life together, a new home with Jesus, and they're going to celebrate it at the lake. I would tell you, um, in the same way that like when you're married and you go to a wedding and you see new people getting married, it should stir something and make you want to be a better husband or spouse. If you're a Christian and you haven't watched someone get baptized for a little while, you should because it it should stir something. We, unless we have something significant going, this is the kind of thing that this church should be known for really encouraging and showing up for. Separate sermon. I'm going to get back to this one. <laughs> you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
the one who you should want to build a life with is the master of life, Jesus. And there's two reasons why he's the master. One, has anyone ever done it better? Has there been one single man whose life has been written about so profoundly, who shaped our culture and society so deeply? We know a beautiful life when we see it, and we've seen one in Jesus. The only single human being who, with every single action of his life, never once caused even the smallest bit of death. That has never been said before. Who better to build a life with than the one who only ever chooses to build life? He's also the master because we Christians believe, and Paul was certain about it, and he staked his life on it preaching around his world and being imprisoned, is that there is no other place to find it. And if you're here and you're uncertain about where you stand with God, I really want to be clear here. We as Christians deeply believe you're in the right place today. There literally is nowhere else to find the kind of life that brings healing, the kind of life that is full and complete. The scripture says, and Paul says it in a real mysterious way, he says that our lives are hidden in Christ and that in some ways like our destiny and our identity, our future is tied and related to Jesus' story. Why would Paul use the word hidden? In fact, in the Greek, it's the word crypto, which is where we get the word crypt from, right? That's a little spooky of a word. It just means hidden. What is it that that means? Why would Paul use that language? This last Mother's Day, uh, my wife, she just told me what she wanted for Mother's Day. Now, that's mostly because whatever I get her is usually a giant disappointment. So now she just tells me it's much more simple. If you want to use this methodology, it might help save you. So she told me she wanted these flowers planted along the garage. And these flowers are really special to her. Because along a fence line at her parents' house in uh, southeastern Michigan, these flowers grow at her house in her home every year. And each year in the fall, once those flowers have kind of lived their life and dried up, her mom would take the flowers, the petals, and the seeds and put them in a bag and save them till the next spring and plant them. The amazing thing was when you put a seed into a ground, it grows. That really is an amazing thing, you know. Can you think back and imagine the first time that that happened? The first time someone decided that maybe instead of eating this seed for nourishment, if I put it into the ground, I wonder what would happen, and someone discovered a miracle. If you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't die. It dies, and then it grows something more beautiful. Now, the same thing happens in Adrian, Michigan, along the fence line of uh, my wife's childhood home. Out of these ugly little brown seeds comes these really beautiful stalks and these flowers that make more seeds. A few years ago, um, my mother-in-law, Archie, she, she died of cancer. I have to tell you, she was an amazing woman. She loved Jesus more deeply than almost anyone I've ever met. She prayed more than anyone I knew. She loved people more than anyone I knew. She was a servant. She gave. She forgave. And she always wanted to please God. In our home, on one of our bookshelves, next to some pictures of our kiddos and a few sentimental little knickknacks that we have, there's a pot. It's not particularly ornate. In fact, it's real simple. In this pot are the ashes, are, are the ashes of my mother-in-law. She's with us. And some people would say that this is the end of the story, that that's the way life ends. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But the problem with that is that sometimes we forget that people are also like seeds. After being hidden, amazing things can happen. Now, the very first human to act like a seed was actually the person who taught a lot about seeds and a lot about death. In fact, after Jesus was killed, they hid him in a tomb, a crypt. And it looked like it was over. There's only one problem. Is they decided to take a human being like a seed in Jesus and they decided to hide him in a garden. Do you know what happens when you hide seeds in a garden? They came alive and they grow. And it's not just Jesus that came alive after death. One of the things that Paul deeply believed, and I do, and is in this scripture in Colossians, is that our destiny and future is tied up in Jesus. 
In the same way that Jesus went through the passageway of death and was resurrected to a more glorified being, that's the same thing that can happen to you. That's the same thing that can happen to me. That's the same thing that's going to happen to my mother-in-law. She's hidden now, but she won't be forever. Scripture teaches, and Jesus himself said, that there's a day when his returning will mean death to every little death that human beings have ever suffered from. And Jesus promised that there's a day coming where all there will be is life. Can you imagine that? A world where the only thing that exists is life. Now, on Mother's Day, I didn't actually get around to planting those flowers. Heck of a husband I am, right? And ironically, the day they got planted was Father's Day, as it was more of a gift to me than it was to anyone else. One of the things that we often talk about here at Woodland Hills, and one of the things that's actually part of our mission, is helping people both inside the church and outside the church discover that what God looks like is Jesus. We talk a good bit around here about a Jesus-looking God. And one of the things that calls this organization and this community together is not only do we believe that the world should know about a Jesus-looking God, we believe that Jesus' body, the church, should be a Jesus-looking church. That the measure of success of a church is whether it looks like Jesus. And I'd like to take that a little step further today. I think there's something else that Paul was concerned about in Colossians. Not just the Jesus-looking God and not just the Jesus-looking church, but a Jesus-looking you. You see, if what Paul says is if if we're supposed to set our minds on, on the things of Christ, not on the things of the world, then the second thing that he gets to is that our our behaviors and our actions and our life has to line up with that. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. Paul's actually going to get real practical and helpful with us. I love this part about Paul. We're not just going to talk about larger concepts of life and death. He's going to get specific. So here's what he says. He encourages us to put stuff to death. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And the list he has up here is pretty important stuff. This is stuff that destroys human life. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Look how seriously God takes these things. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. That's kind of scary, isn't it? The word wrath is not a good one. It's a good question for you to think about. What does a God who is love hate? What does God hate? What makes God angry? The thing that a God of love hates is anything that stands in the way of love. God is ruthlessly determined to remove anything that blocks his love from going to every person at all times, including you. Let's keep going. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Not only does God not want you to, like, bring death to yourself. He also doesn't want you to bring death to others. Has anyone ever brought death to someone else by anger? Anyone here guilty of that? Anyone participated in death by being filled with rage, malice? No one here has ever slandered, right? Anyone ever lie to each other? And what Paul wants to say and encourage us to do is like, take off that old self. It's not you anymore. It doesn't match you anymore. It's pretty ill-fitting. Take off your old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. You know, there's some things that Christians just have to kill. Now, I'm a person committed to nonviolence, so I would say, like, let's make sure that's not other human beings created in the image of God. But when it comes to the things that cause death in you and the things that cause death around you, I, I, I proclaim death to death. Anything that brings death, I say the church should be about killing. And it's quite a tragedy of human beings that as much as we fear death and are terrorized by it, we're fearful and terrorized by death, and yet we choose practices of death day in and day out. It's a tragedy. And I want to say one of the amazing things about Jesus is 
He's the only way out of that cycle through a process called forgiveness. This is a story from one of my uh, favorite teachers. He says, there's a picture I like to use to describe it. We had a daughter who graduated from college some years ago, and my wife spoke at the commencement. So we gathered with a group of about 50 people, faculty and alumni, just before the ceremony. And the president of the school pulled three seniors into the center of the room, and he told us all that they were going to be serving in impoverished areas in parts of the world through graduate or after graduation. He had them each say a few words about what they were doing, and we all applauded. We thought that's why they were there. Then he turned his back on the rest of us, and he faced these three students, and he told them the real reason why they were in this room. He said to them, somebody you don't know has heard about what you're doing and has given a gift so that you would be able to serve in total freedom. Then he turned to the first student, and he looked her in the eye, and he said, you have been forgiven your student debt of $105,000. And the whole room gasped, and she started to do what? Cry. Then he turned to the next student. I'll never forget this. It's one of the most dramatic moments I've ever seen. He turned to the next student and he said to this guy, you've been forgiven your student debt of $70,000. And that guy just started to cry. Then he turned to the third student. And by this time, she was already crying. But it's like she couldn't believe it. And so she wanted to hear the words. And he said, you've been forgiven your debt of $130,000. And we watched the three of them standing there, bawling their eyes out, hugging each other. All of us who watched this were so moved. It was like we had experienced forgiveness ourselves. And forgiveness is a beautiful thing. There was not a dry eye in the room. And I wanted so badly to say, hey, I have a daughter who's graduating. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's important to understand. I hope that a motivation for walking away from patterns of death and towards life isn't just for you. I hope that we always remember that if you're a Christian in the room and you've experienced forgiveness from debt, whatever your 130,000 is, I want you to know that that wasn't free. Somebody wrote a check for that. It just didn't have to be you. See, forgiveness always costs someone. It just doesn't cost you. That's mercy. That's grace. The last thing that Paul gets to in Colossians 3 is I think he pushes on a button that religious people have needed pushed on forever. Pharisees, Christians, all of us. It's a good reminder because he talks to us about what advanced Christianity looks like. Think about that for a second. If someone's going to ask you, what does graduate level Christianity look like to you? All kinds of things could fill our minds, right? Let's look at Colossians 3 and see how Paul wraps this up. What does graduate-level Christianity look like? Since you're God's chosen people, holy and loved, clothe yourselves with, listen to this advanced Christian word, compassion, kindness. What does an advanced Christian look like? He's kind. Humility. Humility gentleness, patience. Advanced Christians bear with each other because they remember that we're not so advanced. We forgive one another if any of us has a grievance against someone. We forgive other people. Why? Because we never forget that we have been deeply forgiven. And in case we mess all those advanced levels up, then we can just get back to the basics, the one thing that is always appropriate to do, the garment that you can put on that is never inappropriate. That virtue is love because it binds them all together in unity. Uh, famous author Anne Lamott tells a story about a little boy. He's an eight-year-old boy. He had a younger sister who was dying of leukemia. And he was told by the doctors that without a blood transfusion that she would die. So his parents explained to him that his blood was probably compatible with hers, and if so, then he could be the donor. They asked him if they could test his blood, and he said, sure. So they did, and it was a good match. And then they asked if he would give his sister a pint of blood, and they told him that it could be her only chance of living. And he said he'd have to think about it overnight. 
The next day, he went to his parents and said he was willing to donate the blood, so they took him to the hospital where he was put on the gurney beside his six-year-old sister. Both of them were hooked up to IVs. A nurse withdrew a pint of blood from the boy, which was then put into her IV. And the boy laid on his gurney with his eyes closed, silent while the blood dripped until his sister, blood dripped into his sister until the doctor came over to see how he was doing. The doctor said, how are you doing? And the boy opened his eyes and said, how soon until I start to die? Um... What's the best way to die? The best way to lose your life is to give it away. It's to choose to die. And the way that you choose to die isn't in some grandiose, heroic fashion. <clears throat> it's every day in small ways. What does compassion require? What does patience and forbearance and forgiveness? Each of those are little deaths, but they don't lead to death. You know where they lead to? They lead to life. I just want to finish up our service with a couple questions, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. In a minute, we're going to take our offering and sing a couple songs together, and then we're going to dismiss for the day. And hopefully lots of us are going to head out to Lake Phelan to see people making a visible decision to die and to live. What's one thing that you could do to set your mind and heart on the things of heaven? You get to choose. If you can't think of anything, I'd say it's good for advanced Christians to remember that some basic things like starting your day out with a time of prayer are good ways that you can start. Second thing I'd say is, what's something that you need to kill? What's something in you that doesn't belong as part of your new life, but it's actually a pattern of the old way of death? Do you have enough courage to kill it off? I don't want you to know... There's one person who's more opposed to death than we are. He was so determined to eliminate death that he met death in its grave and left it there. And if you haven't experienced that, that walking in new life, and you're interested in receiving Jesus, we would love to talk with you and pray with you at the end of the service. Okay? I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Those of you that are Christ followers, your wallet's not your wallet, right? Like kingdom people are called to be generous, and I call on you to do that now. Um, and then we're going to sing a couple songs. The worship team is going to sing while the offering's being taken. Then they're going to ask us to stand together and lead out. And then I'll come and finish the service with the benediction. Jesus, you're the master of life, the one who owns it, who offers it, and who lived it best. Pray for those that are here that haven't experienced that life, that you'd keep pulling them towards you. Pray for those of us that have committed to that, that you'd help us take off the old ways of death and walk in the new ways of life, that you would empower us to that. We know that our life is cared for by you more than we care about it even ourselves. Pray that you would be our leader and that you would bless us as we go. In your name, amen. Have a great week.